hopefully people noticed um, Quentin's announcement, a little bit of change in our, our agenda for today. Um, I'll, I'll let him sort of pick out the details there. Uh, my main job right now is just to impress upon everyone that although this is our last boot camp, which makes me very sad, um, it is not goodbye, right? So you all should now be part of uh, the teams um, and uh, think of the boot camp as your on ramp, right? You know, it's not like uh, you know, I and mean, that's, that's the point of boot camps, right? Um, and just get you ready to go out and uh, to do something. And in this case, uh, the team is still here and the safety net is still here and you can still engage with us and, and, and hopefully with each other and help each other. And, and as we build this community, um, I'll be able to use um, uh, the tools that, that, that we've been showing and are, are still building. So that's just, this is not goodbye. Uh, this is just, you know, the end of the beginning or whatever. I see how many cliches I can get into one sentence. Um, that being said, Quentin's now smiling because he's heard all of my jokes repeatedly. And yesterday he made the mistake of telling me that he looks forward to them because he can tell when they're coming. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna now be unpredictable and say nothing. All right. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen some of David's classic slides, I'm looking forward to seeing them at ITC next year in person. So the Innovations and Technology Conference. Uh, so today we this kind of like the um, chance for us to wrap up some of the ideas that so you've all gotten a chance to play with some of the tools build a little bit on your forms. Um, and this is our last class so we're going to try to fit in some of the things that we don't expect you'll be able to finish fully in this class, but maybe you will because depending on some of them are going to be more straightforward than others. Um, one of the big things is hey you've been learning all about docassemble. How can I set up my own docassemble server? Um, we do not have time to do that live, but it's a very straightforward process. It takes about an hour. We've written up some really detailed notes that you can follow from scratch. And Bryce uh, uh, stayed up quite late, actually. <laughs> Thanks, Bryce, for working on that last night to record a really nice 45-minute video that we'll have up soon. I think, David, you might be doing some editing on it. Um, but so I don't know if you yeah, think- we'll if there's anything up. I got to scrub. If there is, uh, Bryce just- DM me and more. Yeah, just like a very, There's about I think it might be optional whether we scrub it or not, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's just like a very small edit. So it'll be up probably by the end of this week, is my guess. Um, but where we're going to start is just experimenting with, um, let's say you have your DocAssemble server set up already. You've watched Bryce's excellent video. You followed along with the notes. Now, what do you do to get the packages that you need to run the assembly line? installed on your server. So um, Bryce, I think you'll be in a good position to share screen. I can narrate while you do it yes. if you want. And we're going to just explore the back end part of the DocAssemble server. So Bryce, uh, last night, created a, a new DocAssemble server called bcamp.suffolklitlab.org. And this is what it looks like when you get it up and running. You can see that Bryce is logged in as the admin at admin.com account. That's the default account that's created with the ability to um, manage your server. And you've seen a lot of the things on that drop-down menu when Bryce clicks his email address, and um, you'll actually have access to most of those same things. Yeah, so you'll have seen the yeah. playground before, you'll have seen at least your profile. Um, this is the system administrator profile, but you'll see sort of the Git, you'll have seen GitHub integration um, and I, you may have also seen, um, I'm actually not sure what other developers. I don't think people would have seen package management yet, but, yeah, but that's where we're going to go next. So package yeah. management is where we get a chance to install our specific packages on the server. So I want to just let you have a chance to see this. Um, you can see that on, on our server. Um, you'll have the ability to visit it, but please don't install any packages on our server. Um, if you have your own DocAssemble server, uh, you can follow along with us. But otherwise, once you get your server set up, you can come back and watch this part of the video and hopefully we'll make some more sense. So the big button at the top there where it says upgrade, that upgrades your whole DocAssemble server. It changes the version number from 1.2.41 um, to whatever the newest version is. And um, Bryce is pulling up the change log so you can see that is the newest version right now. Mm -hmm. When there would be a new DocAssemble version, you would see both your installed version 
and it would tell you, hey, there's a new version of DocAssemble available. Click upgrade to install it. DocAssemble gets updated really frequently. A lot of the fixes are solving a really specific bug. Sometimes they're adding new features. But every week, on average, there's at least one update. You don't need to maintain the latest version. If you are thinking about how should I set up my own DocAssemble servers, I would advise that you start with two, a development one where you can run the latest code and a production one. Um, a really nice idea if you have the time and budget to set it up, which isn't very much, we're talking about 10 to $20 per server would work for most um, per, per server folks per on AWS. Uh, then you should have a test server, which is almost exactly like your production server. And your development server could be where you try out completely new versions of DocAssemble, for instance. And you want to make sure that before you install it on the production server, you install it on your test server. OK, so let's scroll down a little bit and take a look at that list of packages. So this is a really long list of packages that are installed by default in DocAssemble. You don't really need to do anything with this list at all. These are all the different Python packages that make DocAssemble work. And this gives you an idea. Like we've been talking about this idea of a DocAssemble interview as working with Legos. DocAssemble itself is built that same way. These are all uh, code that was written by people all around the world over time, um, sometimes stretching back decades, that um, Jonathan Pyle, the DocAssemble author, was able to import and make use of in his code. You'll notice a couple of things. There's an uninstall button next to the packages, and there's an update button next to most of the packages as well. If you click that button, it will install the latest version of whatever that package is. Not a good idea to go around doing that unless you have a really good reason to do it on any of the built-in packages. Unless you installed it and you know it needs to get updated, don't uh, use those update buttons individually. All right, and right at the top, all of the ones that have to do with DocAssemble are listed first. This is like a really nice feature for you when you want to make updates to some of the installed packages that you, you created. They're going to be up, late, up here at the top as well, because they're all going to start with that DocAssemble and then a dot and then the name that you gave the package. So the base, demo, and web app ones are built in, but your individual packages will be um, available to see there as well. OK. So you can install packages on, on your own from a couple of different places. Um, one place you might really commonly do that from is from a GitHub URL. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we just GitHub URL. So let's say starting with the, the Weaver, which is this URL will soon change to be Match Weaver, but essentially we have we have this GitHub URL, so we'll go ahead and just copy it at first, um, and then we can copy paste um, copy paste that URL into this part, and you'll know that you've sort of copy paste or you've typed the right URL um, because all of the branches that you have on that that repository will show up. Um, and so, um, like Quentin was mentioning earlier, if you want to have a developer, if you have a, both a developer server and a production server. Say in your develop server, you've been working on a really big refactor on one of your interviews, um, but it's all in an, an entirely separate branch. Um, you can simply install that, just install that branch on um, on your developer server, and make sure it works well before um, before one or before merging that um, branch into your sort of main branch, and then also installing uh, updating the main branch on your production server. So let's say just go ahead and do the standard master and at that point you click update um, and the update process takes a little bit um, takes uh, it depends on how I think it just depends on how big the package is and um, how many different files you have um, and specific how much specifically how much like custom Python code you may have written in those packages um, but whenever you do um, or whenever whenever it's done you should have the, um, the package you just installed on the same page. So I'm seeing like a couple of like really helpful um, notes in the chat. So Michelle has said something that could happen is 
um, that you have that ending slash in the URL if you're installing from GitHub. So why don't we just take a look at that URL again in the browser? Um, but yeah, yeah. So add a slash, hit enter. So that's a valid GitHub URL there, right? It has that slash at the end. You don't want that when you install it in DocAssemble from the GitHub uh, option. Yeah. So let's we can try that on a different um, repository since we're, we're going to need to install a few different repositories for our Weaver to work. Let's and we'll go over what the specific repositories are too. Now we're just kind of showing you how the buttons work. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't, didn't linger to a lot of that screen, but essentially there's the green, everything looks good. And if there's a green, everything looks good, you generally won't have to scroll through the long logs, amount of logs there. Let's go ahead and copy paste with the extra slash at the end. Um, again, it still recognizes it as a proper GitHub URL since it is a correct URL. However, when you click update, um, it won't actually work. And I believe this is mostly a, a Docker symbol bug at the moment. Um, this may, if you're, if you're watching this video, like a few months or a year into the future, it may have been fixed. Um, but for now, for the recent future, you'll likely come across an error. Um, and it's worth pointing out, like if we scroll through this, it's really hard to read this error log, right? Like there's so much information it's giving you, it's gonna be pretty hard to trace the error. So just remember that, that if you run into something like this, you might've added a slash by mistake in the GitHub URL. Mm -hmm. The same, that same problem will happen in the playground as well, if you tried to pull a package from GitHub. Um, so I think that really is a good segue to the question that uh, Stefan just asked which is why don't we upload this in the playground? Um, and I will answer that. <laughs> I, we could do a Socratic thing here, but I think I'll just answer it for you. Um, so here, when you install a package from this menu, from the package management menu, you're installing it so everybody on the server can have access to it. When we upload it to our playground, it becomes local to our, our playground, which means there is a way for people to say, hey, I wanna get a file from playground number one and run it, but the name that they're accessing won't make as much sense. So yeah, let's look at um, the URL when you click save and run. That's a good, good way to do it, I think. So you see here in the URL, and I'm just gonna annotate it so we can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you can see a couple of things here. First, we have the word interview, and then we have a name of the package. So the name of the package is what's right here, docassemble.playground1, because um, Bryce says user number one on the server. But if we wanted to run this interview um, from the installed location, it'll be it'll replace it with the name of the package. So it would say docassemble.assemblyline-wizard here in that URL. And that's a name anyone else in the server could reference to uh, make use of the information from that package. So that's the big picture. It's local versus global install. I think Stefan wrote back on the chat that that made sense to him. Hopefully that makes sense to other people as well. Um, and we'll pause for questions uh, in a little bit too, I think, for, for more questions. I'm sure that there are other things that people are wondering about from seeing that. All right, let's go back to the package management menu. And take a little bit more of a look at what, it's, what else is on there. So if we scroll down now, you can see we have we've installed one package successfully, the assembly line wizard one. And now we have an update. First in parentheses, we see what branch was installed. If you are making a new doc assemble package, you'll never see master there because GitHub has re has changed the default name. Main is the new name that will be there for the default branch of your GitHub repository. We also see a version number 0.7.0 or 0 0.70 rather, you choose that version number um, on the package, uh, on the page where you can upload your changes to GitHub. You can cho choose a version number there and that's what we'll show there. Um, and if Bryce clicks update, that will try to pull in the latest code from GitHub. In this case, there won't be any difference because he already installed the latest one just a few seconds ago. And it might be worth it to sort of just note um, what those the version numbers are. So there's a lot of um, 
sometimes it's zero or like 0 0.70 or it's 1.2.41, which is the current Docker symbol versioning um, scheme. And sometimes people play, play a bit fast and loose with versioning numbers, but sort of odd, like in general, version numbers are meant to be the, the first number is sort of like your major version number. Um, so if you're um, like, that's going to be maybe, like maybe a significant change. Um, and if you're, if you're updating, updating a major to a, to a new major version number, um, you'll definitely want to sort of take, take a closer look to make sure nothing's broken. Um, it might take a little bit more effort when you're updating, um, near when you're updating the code. As you can see, we finished and these are still at version 0.70. Um, and if yeah. you haven't changed that version number in your GitHub, that you have to say, hey, I, I want to change the version number. It's one of the choices you make. You might update it and it will show the latest changes, but it won't change the version number because you have to decide what the version number is. Mm -hmm. And you can decide that right here in the playground menu when you're at packages, um, which is the same place that I don't have my GitHub. I don't have the GitHub set up on the new server yet, but it's the same place you would be committing to new, new changes to GitHub. Um, and adding new files, you can just change your version number here. Um, so generally, every anytime you make a new change that you want other people to see, as opposed to just sort of an inter intermittent change that everything might not be ready yet. But once you're at a point where you want other people to see it and actively use it, you should bump up your version number so they can is it, notice that, hey, something has changed. I should get the new version. Uh, yeah, we'll go back to package management now. OK, so we, we tried. We, sh we showed you what to do to install a package from GitHub. And I want to show you the other two places that, so first of all, you, you notice there's a place to upload a zip file. You've all done this, so it should be familiar with you. You uploaded a zip file to the playground, which made it available to you locally inside your playground environment. You can upload a, a zip file to install it on the whole server from here as well, if you chose to. I do not have any. Know. Yeah. yeah. Um, we won't. I don't actually think that's the best way for you to handle uploading files to your server to make available globally. So I recommend using GitHub if um, most of the time. There is a way to inst install a private GitHub repository if you're doing something where you, you can't share the source code. Um, but you can still use GitHub to manage uh, and control the updating process and the versioning process and so on. So it's a good idea to use GitHub no matter what, even if you want to keep your package private. Um, the last thing I want to show you is uh, uploading a package from PyPI. So I can't remember. I don't think we talked about PyPI here on this boot camp. But PyPI is a repository, is a place to find software that does stuff in Python. So anyone in the world who writes Python software can upload it to PyPI for free. Um, and PyPI will store it and index it, and it will manage Let's say that you have a package that you wanted to install that um, depends on another package being installed too. And um, it will let you see what those dependencies are. So actually we have some dependencies on the assembly line repo, I think, right? So we could even see what that looks like here. Does it, uh, does it even show dependencies? I could be wrong about it showing that. It, doesn't. it definitely has the information available, but I don't know if it shows it in the web version. So. Okay. So if you ever want to install like software that has like a complicated chain of dependencies, the best thing that you can do is to get a free PyPI account, push it up to, to, um, to the PyPI server, which you can do from the playground as well. You don't have to uh, get any other special software to do it. Um, and then it will be easy for someone else to install your stuff. So Let's try installing something. This time, instead of using the GitHub URL, we're going to install something from PyPI. And we'll install the package we were just looking at just now. So we just type in the package name. And click the Update button. So the same Update button installs from GitHub, a zip file, or from PyPI. And let's take a look at that log, which is confusing and hard to read, but let's just take a look when it's finished and we'll see um, what all it's done in the process of 
installing from PyPI. Because here we're going to really see some dependency resolution where it's going to help us see um, all the packages that are connected to the one that we installed. By the way, um, the assembly line wizard package and this one are the only things you're going to have to install to get this up and running on your own server because um, they will bring along all of the other packages. Except actually, I think the toolbox one is not. That's not true for the toolbox one. So I take that back. All right. So if we scroll down a little bit, let's see if we can find where it talks about the other. Yeah, this, it's green, so we know it worked. We should be able to see the other packages it installed here. If we scroll through this, it might be a little hard to find it. Uh, what was I say? The files from this package? I'm, this might have been a mistake to try to scroll through and read this, because I, I, I really almost never do that. There's not really a good reason to it for most of the time. Well, I was I was wrong about that being easy to find from here. Let's click return and look look at what else has come along with this though. Mm -hmm. So we only chose to install docassemble.assembly line. And oh, I I was even wrong about it having dependencies, I guess. <laughs> That's funny. If we had started with something like the mass access one, I think we would have seen assembly line as a dependency. Oh, maybe, maybe. Might be what I was thinking of. All right. So we have a server called, uh, a package called docassemble.massaccess. We're missing the E there in docassemble. Oh, thank you. And um, I believe that is on PyPI. We should have rehearsed this probably. If it's not, we'll learn very quickly. Might not be. Oh yeah, it must not be, because otherwise it would have gotten a message there. Okay, we'll get an error message here, which is good to see too. Okay. Check the install failed. And in this case, it will simply say, generally say, could not find a version that satisfies the requirement, docker symbol max mass access, um, which is sort of just a convoluted way of saying, I couldn't find it, um, which I guess is sort of no matching distribution for it. Docassemble mass access. And I will actually um, go ahead and install that now. So if you're watching this video later, I'm going to put that on PyPI right now so that you can see. Well, actually, why don't I just demonstrate that? So I'll, I'll take over sharing the oh, screen for just course. a second um, so you can see what it's like to do that if you happen to have a need for that. Um, I'm not saying you definitely will have that need, but you might. So I'm going to just pull in. The latest version of mass access into my playground. I don't actually know for sure that this is the latest from here, so I'm going to pull it in first. What I like to do is um, go ahead and get the GitHub URL. This is really detailed, but what we're going into now, but um, I don't think it hurts to have this recorded for later viewing. So I'm going to get the GitHub URL, make sure I, I have that right. I already had this pulled into my playground, but I don't quite remember where it was in terms of what changes it had. So I want to have a, a fresh slate. So I'm going to click delete on the package. That only deletes the package information. It doesn't delete any files from my playground or from the server. It just gives me a clean slate as far as GitHub is concerned. So I'm going to pull that back in from the GitHub URL. And because I have PyPI integrated with my docassemble playground, I do that from the profile page, just like we did for GitHub. I have a PyPI button here, so I can click that and click Publish. And that'll send it up to PyPI. And that's like a minute long delay before it's really available for anyone else to use. So we won't worry about um, installing that live. Okay. Bryce, if you want to share again, you can. I see a question came in the chat. OK, that was actually just a response from earlier. Um, while we're waiting for that to update on PyPI and become available, I wanted to just pause and see if this raised any questions for anybody else. Um, this is a great time to just think about like how, how you're going to be using package installation, what it's for, what it does. Um, and we'll have a complete list of the packages that you should install and where you can install them from. 
and that will be on uh, the, the bootcamp documentation site that you've all seen already. Um, yeah, so at any any questions that anybody has, any kind of question that this raised for you about how to use packages in DocAssemble, um, specifically the packages we're using and how we decided to break them up, any questions that you have are, are appropriate here. Okay, so, so Rena just asked, why is it called PyPI? Let's see if we can figure that out from the website. So it's just short for Python Package Index. And the reason why you pronounce it PyPI, which I just sounds kind of silly, is just because there's an existing Python um, tool that's really popular that's called PYPY. And that said PyPy. So that sound was taken. <laughs> that's why we call it PyPI. I think on the help page somewhere it says, how do you pronounce it? And that's where I learned that. Only recently did I learn how to say that word. Um, well, it should be available now. We can search on this projects menu here, or we could just try installing it. Because I might ask a leading question, um, which would be, why why would you why would you want to sort of go ahead and publish on PyPI instead of just having like since Docker will gives you the option to just install directly from GitHub? Why sort of bother going through PyPI as well? Well. First of all, you might want to use code that's available on the internet that people have built in Python in your code. And so it's not going to be something you can get by installing it from GitHub in most cases. Like the docassemble Python packages are built that way. So you can install into um, docassemble environment easily. But most of the time, those other services are going to expect you to get it from PyPI. So you need to know about that. Once you've started to know about PyPI even a little bit, you might find it helpful to store your own software there so that other people can install it more easily. That's the main reason. It's just to make it, when you have like a final published thing, that's when it makes sense to, so I found it usually doesn't take too long to be available, but it might not be indexed. I don't know how often the update yes. is indexed. So let's try it again, just to see if it's there. Yeah, so PyPI is like kind of a place to put final code, or at least stable code. You might keep the GitHub stuff for smaller changes that you want to install locally on your server and not update PyPI each time. Or you might want to update PyPI each time. It's up, kind of up to you and how you use it, how you want to do it. So once we've installed this package, I don't think it depends on the AL toolbox. That might be a third package we want to have people install. And that one is on PyPI and it's up to date because we tested that yesterday. Cool, so this time it worked. Big success. And let's see if it already brought along AL toolbox. I can't remember. We kind of avoided having too many dependencies because it can lead to having things break if they're not actually available when the order of you installing it doesn't really matter. But yeah, let's go ahead and install docassemble.al toolbox. And that's the last one that you'll need to be able to run all of the interviews you've been developing. Um, you could, so the mass access package, why is that not part of the assembly line package? Well, it's because it has all of our Massachusetts branding in it. You should feel free to just keep that for now. Um, but you might not want to install it if you know already that you're going to override it with your own state branding. So it's optional for that reason. Right now, the Weaver will only will generate a link that requires the mass access package being installed. But if you change it to make it your own state specific repository, you can delete that and you wouldn't need to have mass access installed. All right, so we've installed all the stuff we need. This is really all of the user end side of things that you need to do to get it up and running. Um, and now Bryce should be able to run one of the packages that we created um, from his playground. I guess we could show that. So, yeah, should we run uh, from the playground or can we, should we directly run the wizard, which we have installed? Oh, we could run the wizard. That's a good idea. Yeah. 
I think you had that even open or somewhere, right? That, uh, you could get it from, um, well, it looks like you playground. are running it from the playground right now. Yeah. Yeah. So the one thing that's really awkward in DocAssemble is, is figuring out what packages are installed and what files are in those packages. It's really um, a little cumbersome. Uh, so um, Bryce here does not have any like list of packages that are installed because it's not a default stock thing. This is a new server that we just set up. We would need to put that URL in there manually, in the um, which is going to be probably something we don't have to show right now. But maybe it's worth. Maybe people want to run the Weaver on their own server right away. So maybe we can. Um, so we're going to go type in the word start. This is a, a nice shortcut that is is there for everyone to use as well. So start and then slash. Sorry, and then the name of the package, which is assembly line wizard. Not doc assemble. It doesn't need to be part of it. And then another slash, and then the name of the YAML file. So that is going to be just assembly line, assembly underscore line, I believe. Is it with the YAML? Not dot YAML, just not just the name of the, just that. So that will start the install version of the package. So if you wanted to get up and running right away, you could do that. Um, uh, let me just show, take over the sharing again, just to show you. Um, we won't go over this, but it's pretty well covered in the documentation. You can create shortcut links to different packages that are on your server. And then you can turn on this available interviews shortcut, which is optional. It's not turned on by default. And then you'll be able to see the list of installed interviews here once you've done that. So that'll be a more normal way for you to do it in the future. But there's some other setup there that we're not covering here during the, the boot camp. Okay, um, I think that covers pretty well how to install the packages. You'll have that video to try and experiment with on your own. Um, you can't really break stuff there. I, I mean, I think there probably is a way you could, but it's not gonna be too common a concern that you should have. So feel free on your server to try installing stuff. Um, don't do it on our server, I guess, but but try it on your own and you'll be able to watch um, Bryce's video by tomorrow that goes over how to set up a server from scratch on AWS. We, we, the, the tier we recommend is about 20 bucks a month. So, um, and it's prorated, I think. So you can try it out pretty easily in about an hour of, of experimentation time by watching along with that video. Okay, um, let's stick on, on here now. Um, if people have questions that that raised, feel free to put them on the chat. You can put them on the Teams. I actually should just double check to make sure there weren't any questions on the Teams people already asked. Doesn't look like it. Um, so I'm going to go to my playground. And we're, we're switching gears now. We're going to do one of the really common things that you might want to do in your state specific version of the package, like your version of the mass access package that we installed a few minutes ago. So I'm gonna go back into my playground. I'm gonna to go to the AL generic jurisdiction project I set up. You probably have this pulled into your playground too because we were experimenting with it another week. But if you don't, let me go over how I'm gonna get it into my playground. I'm gonna to go to packages. I'm gonna go click on pull and I'm gonna pull this GitHub URL into my playground. So I will put that both on the Teams and on the um, Zoom chat. So you can get it from wherever it's easiest for you to grab it. Even if you have previously pulled this package into your playground, do it again because um, after we did that in class uh, last week, um, I made some changes and updated, some added some new functionality to it. So you're going to want to have the latest version of this in your own playground. All right, I'm going to go ahead and click poll myself. And I have the latest version in my playground. It's going to say here 0 .0 0.0.4 as the version number. I'm going to click back. And um, You'll see there are a couple of, of files here that um, we can experiment with. So 
the custom organization demo. That's the one we spent a lot of time with last week. And there's a new file here that's called View Courts. So let's try running that and see what it's all about. I just want to pause for a minute because I know this is a place where people could easily fall behind. So um, yeah, I guess give me a thumbs up, give me a reaction if, if you've gotten here and you're able to get to this file. You can use the Zoom reactions if you want. I'm seeing a couple of thumbs up. Um, anybody uh, who who's stuck and uh, is missing a step? and wants us to slow down. So, and I guess for that, use a thumbs down reaction, I guess, or the chat. All right, Jack says that he had a copy and paste mistake, but he's, he's working on it now. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna trust for those of you who aren't reacting, it's just not a reacting day for you, or um, you might wanna watch the video later, which is totally fine. Okay, Michelle says there's not a thumbs down, but there's some other emojis you can use. Great. All right, so let's try running it and let's see what this is all about. So we get a really simple court selection here. If I click the drop down menu, you can see there's three kind of example courts that show off some of the features of having a database of courts that are listed. So we put in the Supreme Court of the United States. And if I click continue, you'll see there's some information that pops up about it, including a map of the court. Um, if I change the court here, I tried to choose very generic names, but then we geocoded them. So apparently there is a main city in Queens, New York City, USA, which it thinks I, I was referring to. Um, so, this is a little bit more easy to read because I wasn't trying to show off all the same features of the database. So you see here, we just have an address and a little description and a map. All right, so you are probably wondering, how can you get your own list of courts here? And, and what would you be able to do with it? So let's look at the file and just see what kind of options we have here in this viewcourts.yml file. Um, so, we have here, we have a couple of things that are going on. This is the question that we just saw where it was pick a court. We have an object here called court list. And you'll see it's referencing a file called court underscore sample dot XLSX. That is a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet that you can edit and change. Um, and you might notice that it looks like you can change the name it's pulling from too. So you can create uh, Michigan, California, whatever courts represent your state, you could change the name there. So it's representative of what you need. And um, if we look down a little bit more, we see here there's this filtering court concept. We put the word none in here, which might be a little confusing. Um, but then when we wanna get information about the court, you can see here, we have just the court that shows the court's name. And then we have all these different attributes of the court that we could display. Like the address, we could put it in a block format, um, the description, and we could make a map of the court too. So let's, I'm gonna do a new share and I'm going to just share my whole screen, which I wasn't doing before. And I'm going to show you where you would get to that Excel spreadsheet, what it looks like and how you could edit it to have different information. So to get to where data sources are stored inside DocAssemble, we go under folders, we click on sources, has that little database icon there next to it too. Sources is short for data sources. And um, this court sample is an Excel spreadsheet, like I said, that's one kind of data source you could use. I already said it can have any name that you want. You don't have to use the name court sample. And you'll see it's a really simple flat spreadsheet with a couple of columns. 
These columns are very flexible. You can use almost any column names that you want, and then you can interact with and filter the list of um, courts based on whatever the columns are that you created, as well as the ones that are built in to the spreadsheet. So the one thing that every spreadsheet should have is a name column. That you'll notice that it actually does matter whether they're um, lowercase or capital letters. So I'm gonna use lowercase name. And then there are a couple of different things that different courts around the country may or may not have. So these are ones that are relevant in Massachusetts, department, division, branch, session, but not all of those are relevant all of the time. So you don't need to, to put anything in those columns if it doesn't make sense for your state. Then we have phone and fax. Um, and then here, there's something a little bit more complicated, but not so complicated. We have these address columns that start out with the word address underscore. That tells DocAssemble, tells our code really, that it is something to do with the address. So not everybody has in every country has the same parts of an address. Um, but the ones that do fit your country, you should keep the same. Um, some of them are optional, like county. You see, I haven't filled in anywhere. But we're going to geocode the addresses. Um, so you don't need to worry about putting in the county if it's something that can be um, figured out when it's geocoded. And um, we also have the ability to use custom attributes. These come from Google Maps. The way, way Google Maps codes an address is the way that you should name the address. And in the example, you can see here, there's a place where you can see the full list of attributes. So let's jump to that for a minute so you can see where we're gonna be working with. What are those things that you could use if you wanted to? By the way, you don't need to touch any of this if you don't want to, it's all optional. Um, you might just stick with the ones that are already in the spreadsheet. If I go to that URL and learn about the address object that's built into DocAssemble, you'll be able to see some of the other fields that it's expecting to have. So these are the basic ones, address, unit, city, state, zip, country. City only you should ignore and not use. Um, and you'll see instead of zip, you could use postal underscore code. That will be true for any country besides the United States, obviously. And then if we scroll down a little bit, you'll see there's a ton of other things that Google Maps has in its geocoding API. Those might make more sense in your country than the ones that we've chosen to put in the example spreadsheet. And you can use those if you would like. And basically you'd be taking the my address part, replacing that with address underscore, and then use the part after the dot for the custom part of the address. So this will load that information in and make it part of the address attribute of the court. Um, we can put in a, a location, uh, latitude and longitude. It's optional. Um, you'll notice that we still were able to map the main city district and superior courts, even though those didn't have uh, geographic coordinates because it geocodes them. So it will use Google Maps API to give those a geographic point. So that's totally optional, but sometimes you might want to pre-code that so you're not having a bunch of API queries that you don't need. Um, description is self-explanatory. And like I just showed how you could have an arbitrary attribute here, something else that you wanted to do. Uh, so let's try looking at the spreadsheet. Let's add a new choice. You might like to have something like a court code that's unique, that's consistent across all of your courts, but not every country or state has that obviously. So I'm not assuming that's not required. It's an optional example um, that I think is good in most states if you have it to, to include here, but it's not required. So let's try adding, um, let's try adding where I used to practice the most, which is the Eastern Housing Court in Massachusetts. So it's from the Housing Court Department, Eastern Division. And I would practice in the Boston session. And actually, I'll, let's even think about how we would fill this in. So I might start by going to the court website and just double checking all the information. Google Eastern Housing Court. I Googled it more than once, you can see. And I'll just copy that information into this. You can use whatever information you want for your state, obviously. I'm going to put in the phone number of the clerk's office. 
uh, I'm not going to put in a fax number because why would someone use a fax number now? I can put in the email address. And you could use this in your doc assemble interview later. Um, all this information we're putting into the spreadsheet. And I'm going to put in the address, which I do know by heart, which is 24 New Chardon Street. There's no suite, it's just in Boston. Uh, I really say USA there, actually, but um, that's fine. And then I think the zip code 02114. And I'll put in the county. I'll leave the fields that don't apply to me blank. I, by the way, I could delete any of these columns that don't matter. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and delete this one that doesn't matter to me. I'm going to take care of deleting this, just, um, let's see. One of these had something weird in it. Can't remember what field it was. Mm, you, did lose a, you did lose a zero in your zip code. Oh, okay. So that is a little annoying Excel thing, right? So um, go, go ahead and, and select that address zip column and change the formatting of it to text. So this is one of the reasons why we're using um, an Excel spreadsheet rather than something like a CSV, because you can't, it's annoying, but you can protect some of the things that you don't want messed with. Good catch. And actually county should really be Suffolk County. Just that's the way it was normalized here. Anyway. Um, copy the description that they have on the website. Not very much of a description, but there it is. Okay. Um, and like I said, I could add whatever, whatever columns I want here. Try to use this as a model though. Like it's better to use lowercase names for your column heading and to make sure that they work as Python variable names, which means they shouldn't start with a number. They shouldn't have any special symbols in them other than an underscore. But they can have numbers and underscores as part of the name of the variable too, of the column. Um, okay, so yeah, Stefan has asked, if, if you put an Excel file as a data source in DocAssemble, is it available to third parties outside of DocAssemble? Um, no, it's not, not unless you choose to make it. It's gonna be all accessed and, and done internally, just like a database would be. Um, so you can have whatever type of, of data you wanna ha have here and protect it. All right, so I've added my core. I'm gonna save this. Uh, looks like I'm gonna have to give it a new name. And uh, let me just do that off the screen here for you all. So I'm going to save it probably just in my documents folder for now. So there's different options that you have. Um, and we built, I built this tool so that it will work if your data source is a CSV file or a JSON file. Those are the other two formats that I built in uh, support for. But I'm going to rename my file. I'm going to call it Massachusetts.xlsx. So the thing about that's nice about a JSON or a CSV file is you can edit inside DocAssemble's environment and never have to re-upload it to DocAssemble. But that is something that is not too big of a barrier versus being able to edit in Excel, which is like a nice, easy to use format right, that everyone has probably done some work in Excel. So I'm uploading the Massachusetts.xlsx file here. Now I have both the sample and the new file I just made. I click back. I'm going to change the file name here to Massachusetts. And now when I do save and run, there's a new option here, which is the Eastern Housing Court. So remember, I didn't put in a latitude or longitude. Let's see how DocSimple does with adding the geocoding correctly on its own. And yep, I get a map of the housing court 
with little information about the court there too. Okay, so if I wanted to show more information, I could display it here. And it's gonna be pulling in, whatever comes after the dot is gonna be pulled in from the columns in my spreadsheet. So I had a, a dot phone column. So let's add the phone number. And now the phone number's there. So you can use that to store information and pull out the information that you want to be pulled out. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think, let's see. This is a little risky to show you something that's advanced that is totally optional. But let's say if I, uh, what is that AL toolbox package? Maybe you're wondering. So if I if I uh, reference that file, docsymbol.al toolbox, it's just dot misc. If I, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of regret showing you this something where, but let me just experiment and see if it actually works first. Cause it's just maybe thinking about the phone number made me think that this would be a cool thing to, to show off. Okay, it does work. So yeah, that is the right thing to do. So I'll give you this so you can see it. I'm gonna download the file cause I know that some of you might've had a typo or be stuck somewhere. And um, I just typed something without really explaining what it is. I'm gonna put this on the Teams channel. And let's see, I'm gonna put it in the thread where I put the link to the GitHub package. So, okay, so you'll if you were stuck and you weren't, so one thing is I've changed the name of the file to Massachusetts. You might wanna change that back to sample data or whatever it was, sample courts. If um, if you did not create your own file and it's not named Massachusetts, but that, you'll have a copy of the file. So what I did here is I just said, I'm gonna add a new module to this. First, I have the AL courts module. That's where all the code that ha happens that let me load in that Excel spreadsheet. And I added this other module that is the AL toolbox.misc module. And that has a function in it called TEL for telephone, which lets me turn a, um, a phone number into a, a clickable link. If I was on a smartphone and I click this link, it's going to actually open up a dialer on my phone, which is kind of a, a neat little interactive feature that you can give to make your app more responsive. So that's just, um, again, that's an example of something that's a Python function that you might want to pull in. All it does is just add a little bit of HTML around the link that tells your browser this is a phone number you can click on and open, but that's what it does. Um, and it's up to your browser how it handles it. Uh, maybe if you have Skype on your computer, it'll open up Skype for you, but I won't do that now. It's not an important detail of this, but it's just something else you could do with that information. And um, if I went in and ran my organization demo, you'll see we we are demonstrating how to use the court selector there too with a little bit more chrome around it that you can take and customize for your own needs okay so this isn't pointing to the one that i just uploaded the massachusetts one so actually let me even try that um, but you could have a placeholder one that's for your whole organization. So you wouldn't configure it each time. If you wanna follow along and you don't care about the custom file you just uploaded, you don't have to do anything here. But what I've done is I've gone into the custom organization.yaml file and I've changed the file name it's pointing to that has the court database. So now when I save and run this file here, the demo file, it'll show four courts now instead of just three, I think. What I wanna show you is how you can filter that list and make it a shorter. So actually it might already be filtered and it might not show the fourth court I added. 
that file not found, sometimes it's just like a timing issue if a lot of people are using the server at once. So I, I, you can generally just click save and run again, and it should work. This is the same thing, just a timing issue on the server. Okay. Yeah, so I don't have that new choice yet. Um, let's think about the best thing to show you. So I wanna show you how you can filter the court list and change that filter. So in my file, here you can see I have this variable that says allowed courts. This happens to be mapped in my interview to uh, the spreadsheet column that's called department. So if I add housing as one of the choices here, in this demo file, inside quotes with a comma between each option, and now I refresh. Um, I might need to go back or do a new save and run. Let me just see what is. All right, let me do a new save and run. Now I see Eastern Housing Court is one of the, the choices there. And like this is our really simple page here. If there's nothing, you can do way more fancy things. You could show a map here. If you knew this list was short, having radio buttons might be nicer than instead of having a drop down menu. Um, but we wrote this little blurb, which is, I think, helpful for people all over the country to use, which is about how to choose a court. So you could reuse that question. But let's say I wanted to customize it and change something about how it looks. Um, I could click the source button and customize it, copy this into my interview and copy it on an interview by interview basis. That's one of the ways you can customize content. Um, I'm not going to mess around with doing that right now. So I showed you this allowed court list. Could be anything we wanted. If in our situation, we don't care about working with the allowed court list of um, being about the department, we have some other column that matters for our state. Like maybe it's the branch that matters. Uh, I would go in and change either by copying in the source from here, source where it says source code for question, I could copy that in and customize in my interview. I could customize that question here. Um, or I could edit it if it's something that happens for every interview in my or custom organization.eml file or whatever I chose to name it. Because the same question is there. If I scroll down, I'll find that question which asks about the court that they're in. Okay, so. There's some different choices there for how to customize that if you needed to for your jurisdiction. Um, I'm going to customize it here so it doesn't change the custom organization YAML file. So it's just customizing this demo one that I'm running. Um, if instead of filtering based on the department, that's set right here. Um, filter courts has two parameters. It has a list, which are all the valid options and then it has a column. So let's say I wanted the, um, the list to be exactly one thing, which is just um, one choice that's gonna be valid, which is Eastern. And then the column, instead of filtering on the department, I'm gonna filter on the division. That works in my um, spreadsheet because I have a column named division and there's a, one that matches the word Eastern. Now when I do a save and run, I'm only going to see one choice, which is going to be the Eastern Housing Court, because it's the only court that has a, col a value in the division column that's named Eastern. So this is, um, I recognize that this is like doing a bunch of changes, and there's a places where you might be stuck on like a very small typo for what we're just going over here. But I wanted to show you basically the functionality that this has, which is 
very flexible, I think, for how you could set up your database, of course, your spreadsheet, of course, and how you can filter it um, and be responsive to what courts you want to show to the user of your interview, depending on other facts that they've provided you. So like, again, like you might do that on a per form basis, like maybe one form only can be filed in the family court and never in a superior court. Um, you might filter that kind of thing there at the interview level, or you might do it um, based on dynamic choices that they gave you. Like maybe they've told you where they live. They almost certainly have told you that. And then you might have chosen to filter the court based on their address. That's some information that you know about them from their address. In Massachusetts, we built like a, a pretty um, robust court location functionality, which lets us say from an address, all of the courts that serve it. That's not part of this kind of more generic state by state version that we've put out for now, because it requires a lot of local knowledge to build that but it's something you could build on top of the functionality that we showed off here. Okay, so um, that was a bunch that we just showed you. Uh, hopefully it helps you get a sense of what the power is and the places where it's easy to make changes and where it's harder to make changes. I did wanna see if anyone had any questions about that. Hi, uh, I have a question. It, it's it's kind of related with what you're showing here. So seeing this Excel sheet, Excel sheet like uh, CSVs and JSON in format, mm -hmm. uh, can you use this to automatically generate documents in bulk? Sure. So just yeah, there's every a... row should be a document without any uh, interview or something. Just you could do that, like kind of like a mail merge. You're talking about. Um, I think there's a pretty good example of that in the DocAssemble documentation. So if, if you go down here under development, there's an entry called recipes. And one of the recipes is for doing mail merge from a spreadsheet. Uh, here we go, let's run up I, uh, recipe number 11. So this uses Google Sheets as your data source. Okay. But you could use a spreadsheet too. And you could certainly look at the code that we we have here um, for a court list of courts and use that to be the basis of something you didn't want to have on Google Sheets. Okay. So you can basically do this locally from an Excel sheet that you have yep. on the server, not like Google Sheets. So exactly. I've noticed down, the, down there, like attachment code, it says item info sheet. What is that? It's a It's a special property. It's one that is just part of this demonstration. So the info sheet is the name of the um, the Word document that I think, let's see. It doesn't actually have the, oh no, here's the info sheet. The info sheet is actually just a real, a built-in DocAssemble template. It's not actually a separate file. And um, it is part of just this, it's not a special built-in built thing. It's just the variable name that um, that Jonathan Pyle chose for this example. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody add a, um, a state for their own, a court for their own state to the file? Curious. Anyone, when they were following Thank along, you. did that? Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Christian. Anyone here, give me a reaction if you successfully added a row that looks like one of your state courts or country courts. Or the court of public opinion. Or the court of public opinion, yeah. Try, trying to introduce a little levity. Maybe we're going a little fast there for folks or, or maybe um, just something that no one was inspired to try live, which is fine, but you'll be able to look at it later. Hopefully that was helpful. We are getting some responses in the chat saying that, that people are following along. And Great. All right, well, yeah, that's the great thing about things being recorded. You'll be able to look at this later. Okay, so that was the first thing we wanted to show you. Um, now I wanna show you like another really powerful kind of um, integration that you can take advantage of. 
which is a um, tool that will help you gather income information, really common task in a lot of court forms. A lot of legal aid forms require you to get asset information, job information, whether it's, or maybe even just an intake that you're doing, you need to collect that same data. So I'm gonna to switch to my bootcamp project here. If you're following along on your own server, go ahead to package management and install the docassemble.income package from PyPI. Go ahead and click update. Um, don't do it on our server. I'll actually, I should make sure it's installed and available for everybody on, on our shared development server. So it's just docassemble.income, all lowercase. And I believe that is on PyPI. I'll put that on the chat in case you are following along on your own server. Um, it's taking a little while to install. I actually happen to know it's definitely installed on the test server because I was using this last night. So I'm not going to wait for that update to finish. And um, let's just see what I have here in my playground. And I'm going to download this file, put that on Teams so that you could follow along with the same very small snippet of code that we have. See, um, I just had to move a lot of things out of the way. So sorry, everybody, for that delay. this open without losing it, and upload it to Teams. All right. OK, so um, you'll see a pretty simple YAML file. It just has a couple of lines in it. We have an, uh, an include statement, which you will have seen in your own files. Um, you may or may not have noticed it. So including lets us take another YAML file that was written by somebody in the world and import it into our own playground. And it will run whatever code is in that file. Um, in this case, it's not running anything that happens on screen until I invoke it, because this is just kind of like a, a library of questions. So I am importing the docassemble.income and there's a colon saying what before I say the file name that I want, which is simple underscore income underscore questions dot YML. I've written a really short question here, which is just mandatory true. So it shows on screen. And then I have question colon pipe, and then the thing that I wanna have shown. So I'm, sh I'm choosing here to show client dot jobs dot table. So let's see what that does. And then let's go back, work backwards to see like what, how you can use this functionality for yourself. So, okay, so it's asking me for my name. That's the person who we were calling the client in our interview, right? You could probably guess. Now I have a question that comes about that asks if I have any income from working. So that probably is referring to the jobs here. Let's say yes. And then I get a question that asks me for information about the person's first job.
and it's using the address autocompletion feature. Um, I can choose whether it's an hourly job or whether I'm just going to look at my pay stubs to fill in the information. So let's say it is an hourly job. I made $15 an hour for 40 hours a week. Um, I'm going to just put in a number for take home pay. And then I have to say how often that happens. I'm going to say that's my weekly hourly wage. All right, I'm going to, I could keep going and saying yes, or I can say no. And I get this table that shows me some information about the, what I've just provided. It shows the amount, it's broken down by month rather than by week. Um, so this is just some kind of like canned functionality that comes from this docassemble.income package that you can make use of and you can see how simple it is to interact with. So let's say instead of saying jobs.table, I just wanted jobs.total. That will do the math for me. I can change it just that small amount. And actually something I'm gonna do is into a sub question instead of in a question, just because it will make it look a little bit neater. So from that same information, instead of showing a table that lists all the person's jobs, I would get, I could get a total instead. So um, anyone guess what this number represents? So I said that I made $15 an hour. Um, and then I asked for the jobs total, 31,200. What does that look like that would have been doing in the background for me? Tabulating annual income. Yeah, it's the annual income, right? So that number might look kind of familiar to you. So uh, let's, we can do a couple other things. We can add. Um, a wrapper around it to make it formatted like currency. So that's just putting the currency function around it. I, I do that by doing currency, open parenthesis, and then closing parenthesis that matches. That'll make it format a little bit nicer for me. Um, what if I wanted to make it broken down by month? I could do that by changing the period being 12, so 12 months in a year, everything one would be annual and would not change anything about this. Um, let me see. It's not just period, sorry, it's period to use. Um, I could have it be every, how much do you make every six months by changing it to six? I could make it every day by sending it to 365. 25, I don't think that'll work actually. I mean, I can't remember if I can use fractions, but let me just see. It does let me, so yeah. So I make about $85 a day if that's my annual wage. Um, and I've done all of that by just using like a really teeny little bit of code here, right? So I'm asking for the total about my jobs. Let's say I wanted to just talk about job number one. There's a nice function in DocAssemble, a method on a list of things that are collected, repeated data, it's called item. So I could do item zero. And then the nice thing that it, about this method is that I am not limited to asking about things that have actually exist. Why does that matter? Let's say you're filling in a financial statement in a, um, a PDF. It has a fixed number of rows. Like it maybe asks for five different jobs that the person has. You're gonna to want to be able to be flexible about showing job, their first job, their second job, they start at zero. So zero is the first job, one is the second job. Uh, without having to make sure that that person actually had zero, one, two, three jobs. Uh, if there's room for that on your spreadsheet, on your PDF rather, right? So the item method is protects you from um, triggering a doc assemble error 
when that job doesn't actually exist. So um, okay, sorry, I apologize for that. It's not total this time. It's just amount because it's only one job. I'm remembering the syntax, so I apologize if I make any mistakes here. Okay, yeah. So I had an amount for job number one, but there's no nothing that it prints out for job number two. I would make, could make it a little bit clearer by writing a little something in front of it. And I might use that, that currency function again to make it look nicely formatted. And here I'm also able to use the um, period to use modifier, the amount. So job two doesn't exist, so it will it'll just basically say there's zero dollars of income from job number two. All right, so what kind of things are built in here? Let's say, um, so we've written no questions for any of these, right? It's all using these built-in questions from this simple income questions YAML file. Um, let's say I wanted to add information about assets. Um, you can see we have some variables available on this list that tells us about the information that's in that YAML file we imported into our file. So I can actually go ahead and just put in, um, we, we already experimented with uh, jobs.table. Let's put in assets.table. I'm gonna save and refresh, and it's gonna ask me some information about my assets now. So I'm gonna say, yes, I do have assets. It will ask me about my assets one by one. And this is going to be a little bit awkward, but you don't have to necessarily use all of these things that are built in. Oh, why? Okay. Let me see if I can figure out what. You didn't say client.assets, but you said client.jobs. Yeah, that's a great uh, thing to point out, Michael. Um, so I didn't say client.assets. Just because this package is making kind of an assumption, an assumption about um, how you're likely to use to gather information about assets. So you can customize all of that. Um, where all this information is coming from is from this income module, which you can pull in from GitHub and, and work with on your own if you wanted to. I thought this worked. So why? Let me just check this. Um, sorry, gave me an error that I didn't remember seeing when I was testing this yesterday. I'm just trying to see if it was something that just didn't push the change. No, I just, okay, it just didn't work. <laughs> sorry about that, everybody. I'll fix that before you watch this video, if you're watching this later. So we won't play around with the assets. The, I can see the problem. Um, what happened is I'm use, I'm referring to a variable X that isn't actually part of the question. So that was just a copy and paste mistake. When I was trying to build this as a, a demo we could work with today, um, I just made a mistake there by referencing X when it shouldn't be X. But Let's go ahead and um, you're not going to be doing this. I'm just going to pull in some of the things that do work. Everything else I think I've tested. OK, so I'm just going to go back to the last version of that code that I had before I deleted some of the other things. So you can see here, this is really a pretty comprehensive list of the things that we can do. We could do, um, we could ask for information from this file without changing anything for any person. We could ask for that person's jobs. Um, for their incomes, which are not from working. We could ask about um, assets, vehicles, and expenses, and real estate. I've written those assuming that they're not person by person, but, but they're the only thing you're asking about on the form. So I hope one of these will work. Having that error, I thought I had tested all of them. I'm going to put in um, real estate now, that table, rather than 
assets.table. Went up late at night, the day before. So that did, did work this time. All right. So um, real estate, something you could play with. Um, you could do uh, vehicles. Um, but maybe something that might be interesting to see because it works a little bit differently is just the way that you can interact with expenses. Fix that grammatically. So for expenses, it would just taken a, like a slightly different approach rather than having you ask about the expenses one by one. Um, I'm just showing how you could ask for what expense categories match that person or their household rather. So let's say I have rent, I wouldn't have rent and a mortgage, right? So I might have rent, food, I might have credit card bills and I have to buy clothing every month. Maybe I have to pay for insurance too. So then it will go through and ask me about those one by one. So maybe I spend $100 a month on clothing some credit cards to pay down. So I have 250 a month for, maybe I'm paying for a family of four, maybe I'm paying $400 a month for food. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and then this is the United States, so for insurance. And okay, so here's a list of all of my expenses. And um, I could do those. This is showing them in a table format. And it just is assuming I want those to be amortized to month by month. But if, let's say I edited this and I was making, I was paying $400 a week, maybe that's more realistic on food. Okay, it really shouldn't be asking me about these again. Don't quite remember, know why it's, it's doing it that way. Oh, I, I do know why actually. Yeah, it's, sorry, it should, should not be re-asking about that when you click the edit button, um, but I will experiment with fixing that. So I have some double entries here, which isn't really what I intended. Um, but that's coming from the way that this table is built. Oh, I, I know why, it's because it's erasing. Yeah, it's, it's a very simple bug that I can fix. But. I could get the total of my expenses too. The same way I can for those other lists. So and I can do that on a, as a daily expenses the same way too. And if I put that through the currency function, it'll take care of those extra digits for me that don't make a lot of sense. You, you want to wrap currency around the whole thing, I think. Yep, good catch. Um, so, you can play around with these other options here. I will do some bug fixing here and make sure that all those work the right way that I just demoed for you. But um, uh, let's see, like something that you might wanna do is just try like asking for things like incomes. Again, that works for any person, but there are some people that are built into my list. So I have a spouse and I have a list of household members which is just called household. Let's, let's say I wanted to have the spouse's other incomes that aren't from working. 
I could just, I just want to, I only care about their total. I can add that. And ask for my spouse's name now. And there's some choices here that made sense for our state. Let's say I wanted to change that list of choices though, by the way, like I could do that just by the same way we kind of showed with the court example, by clicking the source button, I could copy this into my interview. And then I could just change the things that I wanted to change. So it's using code to get that list, but you could do a regular list by using choices and then listing each item separately would be another thing you could do. Um, a lot of options there for you if you wanted to um, to customize the way that the income is gathered without having to change everything or write everything from scratch. Um, so that is I wanted to show everybody today um, those features of the income list and um, by trying to make a simpler example to use today, I've introduced bugs that I did not intend to do. But you could use all of these from scratch and not use any of the questions that I've written. You could still just use the functionality of the income list. So I want to show you where you could learn more about it. If you go to, to um, the GitHub page, assemble income, which is actually hosted at Greater Buffalo Services, that's where I developed it originally. So github.com gbls doc assemble dash income. I'll put that on the chat. Uh, actually, I'll put it right in the Teams thread. There, um, you can see there's a little bit of notes, not really detailed, that explain how to use it and what the capabilities that it has are. So it can give you some inspiration. Um, I know that building a uh, income, some kind of collection of income is something that happens a lot. So I think you'll probably find it useful to not do it from scratch completely. Um, and just thinking about working with the data in lists is, is a really powerful concept too. I wanted to pause there and just check in, see if anybody, if that raised any questions for anybody. Does anybody have like a financial statement form that they're thinking of automating in their state or their country? Anyone just use this time to share about projects you're working on since it's our last uh, boot camp day? And to be clear, you don't you don't have to have something that you're ready to show us. You could want to talk to us about something. All right, so I think some people are more comfortable using the, the chat, which is totally fine. I'm just going to read it aloud for the video later. So um, Lisa is, is saying that this could be something that's helpful for eligibility tracking. So yeah, totally, right? Like if you're doing an intake, you often have to get some income information from the person who's using it. And maybe you want to have that as part of your interviews. Potentially, you want to get basic financial data from the person to see if they qualify for it or just to track it so you can tell your funder later how many people of different income levels were using your your form um, and this can be as comprehensive or simple as you need it to it might be a little intrusive to ask someone to list all of their jobs individually just for um, statistical purposes but um, it might be easier for them to answer your question depending on how valuable interaction they're getting from you. You might do that or you might not. Is there a package that uh, checks against uh, federal poverty guidelines once this oh. has been collected? Great question, Michael. Yeah, there. so there is. Um, and that is actually something that we developed and, have, and plan to keep updating. And it's very simple. 
um, but I'll show you that. Yeah, because I could see in Texas, the um, statement of inability to afford payment of court costs, you'd fill it out one way if you're under 125 and one way if you're over. Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, we have this package called MA Poverty Scale, um, but it's not really so MA specific. So I'll put that on the um, Teams channel too, so people can look at this page for any, whatever documentation it has, which isn't too much. So I have a question that might be a little bit simplistic. We may have already covered this and my brain is just shorting out on it. So forgive me if that's the case, but so the financial, uh, the fee waiver that I'm looking at uh, coding up here in Maine is actually, um, it requires two separate forms. One is actually the fee waiver and then a separate affidavit with all the financial information. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, I would like to have that all as part of one package that will generate both of those forms uh, for the user going through the interview instead of having to go through both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we do that? How do we include two forms, uh, two separate forms in our interview? Will we just aggregate it all into one PDF and then run it through the weaver? Uh, is that the easiest way to do it or is there another way? So uh, that's a something that we're doing a couple of examples of that now. So I think we have some good notes that one of our um, students wrote that are really helpful that we can share that kind of give you a step-by-step -step for it. I'd recommend doing it form by form and then combining them at the end. So like where we in this example that we were just going through in the playground, we're including a file from a different package. You can include a file from the same package too. And so it will be simpler to run it through the Weaver one file at a time, and then you can offer it as a single download for the user at the end still. All right, brilliant, thank you. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get those step-by-step -step, um, pieces of data um, up on the website so that you can see how to combine it, and it will be in, in our, our documentation page, we'll have that there. Um, so yeah, I'm just hearing, from the chat, people are sharing like where they would use something like this. And again, apologize for the rough edges from the demo today. I was, like I said, I was trying to make it simpler and I just introduced some, some mistakes there. But um, eligibility tracking was mentioned, fee waivers and financial affidavit and family law, for sure. Family law is an area where you have a lot of financial data you have to share at multiple stages. So automating that could really pay off. And then, um, and then Lisa is saying in, in Louisiana that the um, Informa Paparis, which is the same as the fee waiver we have here in Massachusetts, we call it an affidavit of indigency, which is even more obscure probably, um, require detailed in information about income um, only when it's below a certain income level. I think that's responding to Michael's point about getting poverty level. Um, I'm saying the... Um... Hi, this is Lisa. I was just going to say, the, hi, that the um, the ability to um, sum up things is really powerful because sometimes the form, you don't have to complete the entire form if you already know that someone's income is at or below a certain level, so long as that person provides documentation. So this, all this, these different kinds of ways of coding are super useful because someone may not need to go through all the questions if um, the program tallies things and says, oh, bingo, you're at this level. Can you prove that you get one of these kinds of um, types of assistance? Or um, then you'd have to go to the next level of, uh, of documenting um, income. So the, the flexibility of this program is really amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and actually, thank you for sharing that, Lisa. I think that's, that's great. Like, that's a really important use case, right? Like, you can save the person a lot of the work that they'd have to do on their own if they didn't have a tool like this to help them do the math, right? Like that, just doing that accurately can be a huge benefit for your users. We all make math mistakes. Um, and when our users are under a lot of stress, it's even more common for that. So we can save them from that burden. Um, so before I, so Konstantinos has just asked, is there a way to talk about how DocAssemble stores financial data so you can show it to the person who's doing it? Um, I'd say like the, the first thing that we would point out is, 
Um, you have a choice in your interviews as to whether you want to encrypt all of the data all of the time. Um, we turn that off on most of our interviews because it makes it impossible to share the data with anybody else or even to share it with yourself and add your signature to it from your phone, for example. But for the right security need, DocAssemble is secure by default. We've actually turned off the in-place encryption for our servers um, in our packages. So that's something to know. If you wanted in-place encryption turned on, you'd lose the ability to add those signatures from your phone, but you'd get a little bit more security benefit. And other than that, out saying, I'm oh, sorry. Just oh, and in transit encryption is definitely turned off. No. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was going to add, which is really worth pointing out. So, David, explain what you mean by like in transit encryption. So, instead of encrypting stuff at the level of the database on the server, we use standard protocol HTTPS for encrypting information transfers between uh, users and the server. So, um, that is not transmitted in plain text. And we actually have a pretty strict uh, data security law in Massachusetts here compared to other states in the country. And those measures that we're using are fully compliant with what the law is here in Massachusetts. So you might have different rules in your state or country. And you also can use those to drive the, the design of your farm. So for example, we have consciously made a decision to not ever ask for social security numbers because there is an additional burden that's required when that sort of information is held. And in our partnerships with uh, the courts, we've, we've worked with them on MOUs to tailor a, a different uh, um, confidentiality agreements that our people will, will work in. And then also the nice thing about the dual, um, at least the two server setup having development and production is you can limit who actually has access to production uh, server such that, um, which is where the actual information from user would be housed. So you can have a whole development team working on everything and then pushing it to production um, with uh, a choke point there of just some tr super trusted users. That way you can maintain control. Those are all really good tips and important to think about when you're designing how you work on your project. You also have the option, Quentin, you want to talk about forgetting data? Yeah, we could talk about that too. So DocAssemble by design, and this is something we have not changed in our settings at all, will forget everything um, after 90 days. So if your user does not make an account on your server, the information will be stored for up to 90 days. Unless you change that setting, you can configure that. It's one of the options in DocAssemble configuration, and it's covered in the documentation for how to do it. Um, the other thing is, like, let's say I'm a user. And uh, Bryce is sharing some some points about this on the chat. Um, I don't know if someone's added them to Teams already. We should put them there too. I'm, I'm adding them there, sorry. Okay. I can go to my profile and I can um, delete my profile. Not because I'm, I'm user one, uh, maybe only if I'm a regular user. Where do I do that? There is an option for you to delete your information from the server is my point. If you've logged in and created an account, you don't have to wait 90 days, you can delete it instantly. So that's actually, we advise people to have the most control over their data. They really should make an account to do that because they'll be able to, to delete that. Maybe it's something that just isn't turned on on this server. We'll have to double check that. I, I believe it's turned on in the dev server. Uh, okay. I want to, uh, if you have that open, I can also check there and just see if I get that option on my profile. I don't, but it might just be because of my security level on the server. I might not let you delete yourself if you're an administrator, only if you're a developer, maybe, or regular user. You can also de delete your individual interviews. That is true. Yeah. So I go to my, my interviews list. I will see a list of, of that's what uh, David's just talking about. That's where I can delete them one by one, each of those sessions. And you know, um, you'll see like it only, for me, it only goes back three months because that's the 90 days that I was talking about. I don't have, even though I've been using the server for the last year, nothing on there that, because we haven't changed the, the deletion time out, it only goes back 90 days. That's the kind of thing that you should um, disclose 
in your terms of service and here in the states. Um, I, you might have more requirements under GDPR if you're in Europe. But um, that was kind of our thought with our design of having, and here I'm going to switch back to this package you can configure for your state. We did something like, which we didn't really talk about before, just just really simple. We made a very simple terms of use that you can edit and customize as a DACA simple interview. So you would have to disclose that information there. You don't need to use the Docsible interview to store your terms of use. You could have a separate web page and that's more standard and you could link to that, but you could. So when I run this, oh, um, question about how long the documentation will be available. We'll be available forever, I think. And we're not planning to delete it at any point. As long as the university keeps paying for Teams, Teams will be up. As long as GitHub keeps giving free uh, web servers, the documentation will be up. It may change in a little bit of form. We may go back in and make them more robust. So they might get better with time, but uh, otherwise it'll be able to, should be able to find things. Also we some might. of the specific questions you all have gone into, right? It's some, some of the more, if, if you're looking for more specifics about the questions you've asked, Teaching Tuesday is an excellent time to come by and um, drop those in and we can probably give some more details that we didn't manage to give here. Yeah, Michelle, you wanna explain what Teaching Tuesday is and how people could attend that? Oh, sure, that would help. Um, so Teaching Tuesday is our, on Tuesday at uh, one o'clock. Um, it's where a couple more experienced people um, commit to being on the channel and um, to being on, on uh, the Zoom workspace, sorry, Zoom workspace, Zoom meeting. Um, and we post about that regularly in the assembly line channel. And people come and ask questions about doc symbol or ask questions about assembly line. And we dig into so, uh, the details, problems people are running into or questions they have. I don't know. So you can join those every week. I mean, I can't say we commit to having them every week forever, but we do indefinitely. And we've been having them for the last year, so. Um, okay, so, oh, I wanted to highlight, this is something that we, that just happened this week. Michelle built this nice new interface here to replace the audio play button we used to have. So that's something you'll get to see if you pull in the latest version of our code onto your server or in your own interviews, you'll see it too. Um, we talked about terms of use. So I showed you how you can customize those in that generic organization when you're customizing that package. Um, I thought I would just follow up on Michael's point because it just goes along with how you can use income information, right? So um, I had opened up a page here, which I don't, I think I closed. So I'm going to go back to it. That just had um, information about the poverty level. Here it is. It is still open. Let me open that up side by side. Okay, so I'm going to include this file. It's docassemble and the dash in my playground is going to be replaced with the dot. So I'm going to include docassemble um, I can use the same file. I'm just trying to decide if I should make a new YAML file, but I'm not going to. Dot ma poverty scale instead of dash. a colon, because it's part of a package. And this tells me here, I need to include this file called poverty.yml. So I'm just gonna save. And now you'll see, I have some new variables in my list of variables that are available. So I can use those in my code. So, let's see. Let's say I, I've collected jobs. And I collected other kinds of income. I 
And I want to know if those are um, less than, let's see, I think there's a good detail of how to combine it, which shows it here. So I'm going to assume a household of size one. So it's just going to be poverty increment. Now, let me see. I think this is looking at, I'm trying to remember. So we're using this in a couple of packages, but it looks like I'm looking at the income divided by 12. So I'm thinking this is monthly income I need to compare against. And that must be what the poverty level that I'm using in this is based on. I could just check really quickly. No, it's definitely annual income. So I need to combine two things. I'm also noticing now it's the base plus the increment. This works for us. If people are really interested in this package, we could have more user-friendly wrappers around it. I'm just going to check, is their income plus their, their jobs, is that less or greater than? I'm going to get rid of all the other stuff here and just focus on this question. Is the income that they have from jobs and from other sources less than the federal poverty level? Do you need parentheses around the incomes to combine them? Um, I should not just because of the way that order of operations works, but it can't hurt to add them. So it's clear. So you don't ask yourself that. That's a really good idea. So yes, I should do that. And um, you can see here, right? Like there's more fancy things I could do. So I put in a poverty multiplier of 1.25. That's the threshold that the Massachusetts courts use for federal poverty, they multiply it by 25%, 125% rather, to figure out what the actual threshold is they care about. And I could save and run this. And where am I getting an error from? Let's see, probably a missing parenthesis. Oh, I just have instead of a, a curly bracket. So let's do the simple case. Uh, it's going to make me say my name anyway. And say no and no. So yep, definitely under the federal poverty level there. Um, let's say that I get um, Let's say I have a pension of $10,000 a month. I'm no longer under the federal poverty level. OK, I see a bunch of questions that that raised for people in the chat. So I'm just going to check and see what those are. Oh, this is just about Teaching Tuesday. Uh, let's see. OK. Great. So this is um, just, I think what you're seeing from this is not just like the, hey, that we've stored the federal poverty level and that we intend to keep updating it annually. That might be cool for you to see, but also like just thinking about how you can design your interviews. So you're not repeating yourself in every interview, right? I've put this information about the federal poverty scale. It's very simple but I'm not kind of having to worry about copying and updating these five lines every time in every interview when I change it. I just update it in one package. I install it on the server. All of the packages on, on the server reference this, and they're going to have the latest version of those data. That's really the important concept, not like the specifics about what it is and how to use it. Um, 
just that it is there. It's, it's a design pattern that you can follow for your own coding. Um, so. Though people will have to update that package annually, just hit update, right? They will need Make to sure update the package it. itself annually. So yeah, like, I mean, something, another pattern that you could use is an API um, where there's like a server that updates itself and it will always have the latest information when you have data like that, but that's just not a pattern that, that we're using here because it just adds a lot of overhead. It's not, uh, not doable, but it's just something that we haven't chosen to do. All right, we have five minutes, um, a last chance to ask questions. Might be good to highlight some of the stuff in the chat about Teaching Tuesday and just clarify, yes, those are open to anyone. Um, you can find the link in the Teams uh, but not in the bootcamp channel, although we can drop it in there uh, one last time, but in the assembly line channel. Um, and we, you know, if you're working on, we have a very um, inclusive view of who's working on the assembly line project. So the assembly line project is what we see as the broad umbrella for anyone who's working on these court forms in any jurisdiction throughout the world. Um, we have a specific Massachusetts implementation in which we call the court, courtformsonline.org, which is that site. But assembly line is the big umbrella, and you are all uh, welcome to uh, count yourself part of that as long as you're, you know, doing the, the good work of, of getting people access uh, to the courts. So please, um, please be part of that community. Please, please join us. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone's welcome. Okay, well, I would encourage people again, like if you're working on similar projects, you, some of you might have already been finding each other on the channel, the Teams channel, but I would encourage you to use that as a resource too over the next couple of weeks, or in, as long as you're interested in working on any of this stuff, it's, we're gonna have that as a public space you can keep using. Um, so that is it for, for me and all right now, but <laughs> any other closing thoughts that you wanted to give, Dave? Um, no, just any of the any of the other existing team, Michelle, Bryce, um, anyone else who is on the call who uh, has been working on this who wants to say anything or thinks there's something we, we didn't want to miss. Just wanted to say thanks. This has been great. Yeah, and really, don't be strangers. That's the the main thing. I know today we got a little into the weeds, um, but that hopefully that has given you some ideas and uh, know that it's not. You're not playing without a net. Um, please don't be strangers. And we have a casual uh, counterpart to Teaching Tuesdays on Fridays at one at the same link. So you can just come and hang out and we won't talk about work. So watch for that link too. All right, then. All, yeah, we talk about all kinds of silly things then. You can, it's not recorded. <laughs> yeah, we do not record that one. All right. Cheers, all. Thank you very much.